Hello, and welcome to this third lecture in our course, Linguistic Field Research Methods, held at the University of Bayreuth. This lecture is an introduction to the Gorwa language and is designed to establish some language contexts, present some of the basic structures of the language in overview, and point to further resources available to learn about the language. You'll notice that this is not the approach taken by many introduction to field methods courses, where participants are often discouraged from engaging with previously written materials in order to simulate working with an entirely unknown language. Today, however, I believe it is reasonable to assume that most, if not every language, has some existing resources, and that it is important to know as much about the target language as possible. In this way, we avoid unnecessary repetition of work and can focus on more advanced and targeted topics. To begin, my name is Andrew Harvey and I've been working with speakers of the Gorwa language since 2012. In a wider context, I'm interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, of which Gorwa is a part, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through language contact and linguistic arts. In today's lecture, I will start by situating Gorwa in its wider geographical, historical, and social context. I will then provide a brief comment on the data I use here and how to access it. We will then move to the structures of the language itself, its sounds, phonology, its morphology, and uh, some open parts of speech, namely nouns and verbs, as well as its syntax and one closed part of speech called the selector. We will then talk a bit about the resources on Gorwa available to us and how to use them. I think it's important that before we engage with the language from a formal perspective, we first take a moment to look at its position within the larger community in which it is used. So starting with a brief note on history, I will talk about the relationships, both genetic and aerial, which obtain between Gorwa and other languages. Following this, I will talk about language use, language attitudes, and finally, the language name. But first, for an idea of what Gorwa looks and sounds like, let's listen to a short recording of Gorwa in which Bejero Quetzo talks with Pascal Bu and Bu Sahuare about the prophet Saigilo Magena. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Here, care of Google Maps is a rough map of the current area in which Gorwa is most commonly spoken and in which most of the people who identify as Gorwa live. We can see from the inset that it is spoken in the north central part of the East African country of Tanzania. Today, this area falls within the administrative regions of Manyara as well as a part of Dodoma region. The area is hilly with the dormant volcano Mount Kwara and the Lake Babati at its center, and the Tarangiri Plains and the escarpment of the Mbulu Plateau as rough geographical boundaries. Babati is the largest urban area, having served as the regional capital of Manyara since the early 2000s. It is 
primarily an agricultural center along with the offices of government services, NGOs, banks, and larger businesses. I'd like now to talk about linguistic relationships, that is, the links that exist between Gorwa and other languages, both through shared origin or through geographical proximity. If we swap our visualization representing the Gorwa speaking community in the previous map as the single blue pin at the center of the map here, and zooming out, we can see all of the other languages to which Gorwa is closely genetically related. These range from Iraq, here at the top, spoken across a large area of north central Tanzania by almost half a million people, to Burungay, here at the very bottom of the map, probably spoken today by less than 13,000 speakers. The group of languages is known in the literature as the Southern Cushitic branch of Cushitic languages, and in a genetic tree adapted from Kiesling and Mouse 2003, can be represented like this. We can see that Gorba shares the closest genetic relationship with Iraq. Comparing some words across South Cushitic as well as their reconstructed proto forms in Proto West Rift, we can see resemblances across all of the languages. The relationships which Gorwa exhibits are not, however, simply those of shared lineage. The larger area in which Gorwa is spoken, the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, has been witness to the movement of humans for a very long time indeed, and it is here, the only place on the African continent in which all four of Greenberg's African language phyla are in contact and have been in contact for a long time. In addition to this, the Rift Valley area is home to peoples and cultures which see the world and inhabit their environments in very different ways, from people who rely primarily on livestock, to farmers, to people who get much of their food from hunting wild animals and gathering wild fruits and tubers. Some societies, like the Gorwa people, are patrilineal, where inheritance and descent pass through the father's family, while some are matrilineal, where inheritance and descent pass through the mother's side. These are only some of the ways in which the Rift Valley area is both rich and diverse. Here we have a map of the Tanzanian Rift Valley. Immediately we can see that Gorwa exists at the geographical center of a highly diverse area. This includes other southern Cushitic languages, Iraq, Alagua, and Burungay, as mentioned above. Nilotic languages, including the Eastern Nilotic Maasai, and probably more significantly, the Southern Nilotic Totoga varieties. Bantu languages, uh, both from the Takama branch of Bantu, including languages like Ihanzu, Nyilamba, and Yaturu, as well as Bantu of other affiliation, including Gogo, Kilimanjaro Bantu languages, and less certainly, Rangi and Mbugwe. Sandawe, which is possibly a distant member of the Khoikwadi group of languages, uh, is also included, as well as the language isolate Hadza. In terms of language use and attitudes, I would first say that this topic deserves considerably more attention, but suffice it to say that Gorba has around 133,000 speakers, and its usage is certainly declining as its speakers switch to using the national lingua franca Swahili. In my experience, language attitudes are characterized by a divide in both age and whether speakers live in urban areas or in more rural locations, with the language seen as more relevant and valuable among the old and those living in rural areas. Gorwa is often called Gorowa, and in fact, all of the highest profile sources for language data use this form. Uh, the form Kigoroa is also seen, which is simply the Swahili form of this word. Early works by outsiders use the terms Fiome, Fiomi, and Ufiomi to refer to the Gorwa people and language, where Fiomi refers to one name of the mountain at the geographical heart of the Gorwa speaking area. Gorwa people themselves refer to the language as Tsifrir Gorwa, or less commonly Tsifrir Gortii, and so Gorwa is the term I will use. There are other ways to refer to the language, specifically by its ISO 639-3 code, G-O-W, or its GLOTO code, Goro 1270. As an introductory note on data, this talk itself will be archived with the following DOI, and will also be available 
on my YouTube account, which could be accessed by following the QR code on screen. In terms of accessing the examples used in this talk, most utterances of phrasal length or longer which occur in my database are given with a unique identifier, which occurs to the right of the first line of the gloss. These unique identifiers are made up of two parts, an alphanumeric code to the left of a full stop and a number to the right of the full stop. The alphanumeric code refers to the file name in which the recording can be found. And so any interested listener can navigate to the Gorwa archive deposit, which you can do via the QR link on screen, and enter that file name into the search bar highlighted here. This will return all of the files and folders associated with that file name, including the recording itself, as well as XML files created with the Elon software, which can be used to see transcriptions and translations of the audiovisual material. The number to the right of the full stop refers to the utterance number within the audiovisual file in which the utterance occurred. So once the ALON file has been downloaded, one can navigate to that utterance number in the ALON file and listen to the utterance, as well as check it within its larger context. The specific example is highlighted here. To start looking at Gorwa from a formal perspective, we'll start with the sounds of the language. We'll begin with the phonology and then examine tone, followed by some examples of how these two elements interact with the language's morphology. First, Gorwa is a five vowel system with long and short versions of each for a total of 10 vowels, along with semi-vowels w and y, along with two true diphthongs ow and i. Other diphthongs can be analyzed as vowel-semi-vowel -vowel combinations. The consonants of Gorwa are presented here, with perhaps the most notable features being the rich array of sounds produced towards the back of the oral cavity, such as the pharyngeal consonants uh, r and h, and uh, a large inventory of labialized consonants, as well as ejective consonants, the most articulatorily complex being the palatolateral ejective affricate uh. Note as well the absence of voiced fricatives. Finally, sounds in brackets are uncommon or marginal sounds in the language. Moving from phonology to tonology, we will now examine each of the following tonal properties in Gorwa. So first, Gorwa has two underlying tones, high and low, where low can probably be analyzed as zero. Also, the language tolerates one tone per word. As a result, the surface level realizations we observe in Gorwa words are level, rising, vocative, falling, and rising, falling. The distinctions between level and rising play a particularly important role in Gorwa. Here we can see rising and level being the key way two words are distinguished with ninga, a type of pigeon, ninga, having rising realization, and ninga, a drum, ninga, having level realization. Even more widespread is the use of level and rising to mark grammatical differences. In the first case, the form with level on the noun and rising on the verb means the boy was ill. Yarma ina mama. And in the second case, the almost identical form with rising on the noun and level on the verb means the boy who was ill. Garma a mama. Vocative manifests as high tone on the penultimate syllable and is used to call someone. Ina odasi. Falling, by contrast, seems to be a special low tone on the last syllable and is used to add emphasis. Rising falling, on the other hand, is used to mark a question. I would like now to talk briefly about how the sounds of Gorwa interact with the morphology of Gorwa, specifically what happens when consonants come together and when vowels come together. First, when two consonants come together, they are often realized as a geminate consonant. The word danu, honey, when pluralized, is usually realized with a geminate 
N, so the form that we get is DANNE. The same occurs with the noun for phone, SIMU, in the singular, becomes SIMME in the plural. Vowels, on the other hand, undergo coalescence. This is represented in this chart where vowels in the left-hand column are the first vowel in a two-vowel combination, and vowels on the top row are the second vowel in a two-vowel combination. The result is the vowel listed in the intersection of the two. Cells with blanks indicate that I don't have an example of the two vowels occurring together and therefore don't know what happens. Take, for example, the noun hawata, men. When it occurs with its linker morpheme, which is a high-toned O, the A-O combination is realized as O. When the final U of the linker in muku, people, combines with the E vowel of the demonstrative, the combination is realized as E. Similar patterns exist to deal with tones that occur together, which can be subsumed under the umbrella term of tonal culminativity. That is, because basically one tone can manifest on the word, it is the tone of the final morpheme that determines the overall surface realization of the word. Take, for example, the tone of the verb tah, hit. In the example given here, garma, baha, nina, tah, Ta has a high tone as its basic realization, but the morpheme that marks it for a masculine subject, here written as dollar sign B, takes away that high tone. Next, the morpheme indicating past tense, again a high tone, restores that high tone. So at the end, the structure is ultimately realized with rising tone. Ta. Finally, a further operation called apocope can affect both segments, like vowels and consonants, as well as supersegments, like tone. Apocope is an operation in which words lose their final sounds in certain environments. Take once again our example, garma, baha, nina, tah, and the verb at the end, tah. You'll notice that I indicate in the gloss that the verb actually has a final morpheme, a, ah, which is not pronounced in the surface realization. This is due to the apocope operation, which basically says that when some suffixes occur at the end of a phrase, they are not pronounced. We can see that the ah isn't always unpronounced. Indeed, it would be silly to propose a suffix that is always invisible. Take, for example, this phrase, do u kahan, we are building a house. Note once again that the verb has a final ah, but that this again is not pronounced. Compare this to its question form. Do utehana, where the final a appears. Because a is no longer the final morpheme in the word, it does not undergo apocope and is pronounced. The same thing happens in nouns, with the relevant morpheme being the linker. As we can see here, the linker for hawata, man, is a high-toned o, but when we say the word man, hawata, we do not pronounce the o. If, however, we add an adjective to the end of the phrase, as in hawato er, the o no longer undergoes apocope and is pronounced hawato. Moving now to morphology and the open parts of speech, we will in turn look at the noun followed by the verb. There are other open parts of speech in Gorwa, but for reasons of time, I've chosen to focus on these two today. Here is a simple phrase in Gorwa, garma baha nina ta, again, the boy hit the hyena. When we break it all down into its constituent morphemes and its glosses, it looks something like this. The phrase contains two nouns, the boy, garma, and the hyena, baha. Compare a second phrase, baha garma muna ta, the hyena hit the boy. And in the first phrase, the noun garma is the subject, and in the second phrase, the noun garma is the object. Note that despite its role in the sentence, the form of the noun stays the same. And the same goes for the noun baha. Its form does not change whether it is object, as in the first phrase, or subject, as in the second phrase. Rather, what happens is that the agreement on the verb form would change, which we will get into later. You'll also notice that the position of the arguments would typically change as well. But 
Where agreement explicitly differentiates the arguments, the change of position is not obligatory. So you can see that as long as the verb form indicates the roles of its arguments, we can have relatively free ordering of those argument nouns in Gorwa. Returning now to the nouns at hand, when we provide the interlinearization as I currently understand it, we can see that both nouns in this case are composed of two separate morphemes. This includes the stem, which contains some but not all of the lexical identity of the noun, as well as one other morpheme, which I call the linker. Now, we've already seen that the linker will go unpronounced if it occurs at the end of a phrase, but will be pronounced everywhere else. But the most important characteristic of the linker is that they show different forms depending on the grammatical gender of the noun to which they attach. In this case, the word garma, boy, is masculine in gender, and the linker occurs as a high-toned o. And the word baha, hyena, is feminine in gender, and the linker occurs as r with an accompanying high tone. The stem is rather more complex. Not only is it where lexical information about the noun lies, but also information about its gender and number value. In fact, the way I've represented the stem here is simplified. Take the noun Baha, for example. The singular noun is given on screen, Baha, and the plural form is Bahu. These two forms show that the stem is actually formed of at least two different morphemes. The morpheme A, here marking singular, and the morpheme U, along with an operation which shortens the stem vowel, marking plural. I've written extensively about these suffixes elsewhere and have identified more than 40 distinct nominal suffixes for Gorwa. It's probably fine to represent Gorwa noun stems in this way, without breaking them apart into their two separate morphemes, and simply to remember four general rules. Rule one is that every Gorwa noun takes a set of suffixes, which I call a paradigm. Paradigms may be monads, that is, a set of one suffix, like the word for water here, pairs, a set of two suffixes, like the word for hyena here, or triads, a set of three suffixes, like the word for crowned crane here. Rule two is that the paradigm taken by any given noun is unpredictable. That is, there is no way to predict which suffixes go with which noun stem. For example, the noun stem meaning crowned crane takes a triad paradigm of the suffixes umo, zero, and ama, whereas the noun stem meaning rooster takes a pair paradigm of the suffixes umo and ama, and cannot take the zero suffix. The set of suffixes any noun stem takes must simply be memorized. Rule three is that some suffixes are valued for number. For example, the suffix umo is valued for singular number. Therefore, nouns with this suffix can only occur with external elements like adjectives, which are also singular for number. If we try and put a noun with an umo suffix with an adjective in a plural form, the form is ungrammatical, which we mark with a star. The zero suffix, on the other hand, is unvalued for number. That means it can occur with adjectives which are either singular or plural. These combinations often result in a collective sort of reading, in this case something like the translations provided here. Rule four states that it is the noun suffix and not the noun itself which determines gender. As such, when a noun is changed for its number value, its gender value may also change. Bringing back the linker, we can see that the word baha, hyena, is feminine in gender, whereas the word bahu, hyena, is neuter in gender. So we get a switch in gender when we change the noun for number. This often manifests in surprising ways. The singular form barisumo, old man, is masculine in gender, but its plural form barise, old men, is feminine in gender. The Gorwa verb also hosts a rich array of morphology, which we will now examine in overview. Returning once again to our example and focusing on the verb, we can see that the verb here can be broken down into four separate morphemes. 
This includes the stem, which contains some but not all of the lexical identity of the verb, as well as four other morphemes. We will start from the suffix closest to the verb stem, the subject marking morphology. Immediately this form looks strange, but the dollar sign is simply an arbitrary symbol I use to indicate a morphophonological operation which affects the verb stem to signal a masculine subject. The morphophonological operation here is to lower the high tone, but we obviously don't see this on the example because high tone is added again by the past tense morpheme. We'll remember that tone is culminative in Gorwa. Compare a present tense form where we can see the high tone of the basic verb form dropped. Compare the masculine past form ta to the feminine past form ta, which undergoes a morphophonological operation which shortens the vowel of the verb stem as well as preserves the high tone. In fact, Gorwa verbs fall into six distinct inflectional patterns in terms of person agreement but I've argued elsewhere that all of these can be explained by a recourse to the same set of morphophonological operations. Making these forms plural involves using the singular bases and then adding an additional plural suffix, as can be seen in the table here. Gorba distinguishes between present and past tense, as noted above, past tense is marked by a high tone whereas present tense is unmarked and can be seen in the distinction made here. In addition to this, in the past tense, the word final a, where it is pronounced, changes to e. Compare do u kahana, are we building a house, to do uga kahani, did we build a house? These phrases are also good examples of how Gorwa marks the interrogative mood on verbs with a rising, falling intonation. Compare this with a subjunctive mood, which is marked with low tone and therefore level pitch on the verb. Finally, the final vowel, rather vaguely named, seems to be associated with tense. That is, it occurs on verbs marked for tense, but never occurs on non-finite verbs. Perhaps the best example of non-finite verb forms are imperative forms, and here we can see that Gorwa has a relatively rich set of imperatives uh, that differentiates uh, features such as uh, whether the addressee is singular or plural, whether uh, there is an object involved in the imperative, and whether the movement is moving towards the speaker. Though we don't see it in our example, verbs in Gorwa can also be marked with suffixes which change the argument structure, or more generally, the meaning of the verb. Take, for example, the verb del, which means to stop by. If we add a middle voice extension, the verb then means something like to be in a state of stopping by. If we add a causative extension instead, it means to cause someone to stop by, or more idiomatically, to keep someone from going. Multiple extensions may be stacked on top of each other. In this case, the verb durch is extended twice to form durchis, a verb meaning roughly to cause, to marry. Returning to our example, we have so far discussed nouns, like the forms highlighted here, as well as verbs, like the form highlighted here. I'd like now to discuss one final form, an example of which is highlighted here, and which in the literature on South Cushitic is called the selector. Basically, the selector is a collection of affixes surrounding an auxiliary verb and serves some of the key grammatical functions of the phrase, including indicating who did what to whom, notions like aspect and voice, as well as other functions. In fact, the selector is so important that without it, most Gorwa phrases are ungrammatical. In this example, the selector is formed of four parts. At its core is an auxiliary, which in most cases is phonetically null, that is, it goes unpronounced. If, however, the selector has no argument marking, it surfaces as a. Ah. Selectors usually mark the core arguments of the verb. 
Here, the third person agent, the entity carrying out the action of hitting, that is the boy, is marked as the ng prefix. And the feminine patient, the entity undergoing the action of being hit, the hyena, is marked as the a prefix. If there is only one argument in the phrase, the marking is slightly different. Here we can see that the boy is marked as the prefix e in the selector. All of the affixes present in the Gorwa selector are given here, with items occurring within the same column unable to occur together. With our example sentence as a model, we can see that the selector marks an agent argument, a patient argument, as well as imperfective aspect. Whereas the particularly rich selector in the phrase maskadosh, why is it being farmed, where the thing being farmed is feminine, such as a field, is marked for questioning mood, medio passive voice, agent and patient arguments, as well as for the adverbial for reason. Returning to our examples of word order, we can see that the arguments in a Gorwa phrase can occur in various orders, basically because it is the selector which tells us who is doing what to whom. Change the argument marking in the selector, and the meaning of the phrase changes. As a final note, there is one additional word order I'd like to note, and that is this ordering, where the object noun, in this case hyena, occurs between the selector and the verb. Here we can see a couple of important differences. The first is that the object noun, in this case hyena, occurs with its linker morpheme overtly pronounced. This is presumably because the selector and the verb in Gorwa form a phonological phrase, and when the object noun occurs between these forms, it is essentially occurring inside of a phonological phrase, and the apocope rule no longer applies. The second is that objects between the selector and the verb are no longer marked on the selector, and the selector behaves as if there is only one argument now, in this case, the boy. We have some ideas as to why this ordering occurs and why the marking changes, but any really good explanation of these phenomena would pay very close attention to the pragmatics of Gorwa, a whole other topic which we will have to wait for another day. Finally, I would like to mention some of the principal resources we will be working with during the course of our study. Though still largely undescribed or underdescribed, a number of resources about the Gorwa language are in development and will help us develop effective questions and move our understanding forward. The other two resources are people-based, which we'll also take a moment to discuss. The first resource is Harvey 2017, the Endangered Languages Archive Deposit of Gorwa, which I've been building for the past few years. Eventually, all materials I've recorded or created as part of this project will be openly accessible here. At present, all of my work up to and including around the year 2020 is accessible here and available for anyone to use. There are also a couple of publications about the Gorwa language, the most important of which probably being my 2018 doctoral dissertation, which contains a Gorwa sketch grammar and which can be accessed by the QR code on screen. Additionally, over the past few years, I've given a handful of talks about Gorwa, all of which have been recorded and are on my YouTube page, which once again can be accessed by the QR code on screen. Our greatest resource during this course will be our Gorwa language consultant, Hezekiah Cody. Hezekiah has been one of my primary consultants during my work on Gorwa, and not only is he an astute and scholarly language consultant, he speaks very fluent English and will therefore be able to work with all of us. This is not the case for many other speakers of Gorwa, so we're really quite fortunate to be learning with him. And of course, we have each other. Data collected by one individual will be available to all of us, and we should get used to sharing analyses asking each other questions, and generally helping each other through what I hope will be an intense, stimulating, and fruitful period of data collection. Field linguistics can be conducted in many ways and in many different contexts, with different languages, different questions, and different tools, but I'd like to think that the one unifying characteristic is that it requires reflexivity, the ability to examine one's work and one's approach critically, 
with the constant question of, how can I do this better? It is my hope that we as a group can be reflexive and that we can constantly improve both our understanding of Gorwa but also our practice as field linguists. Thank you, and here are some references.